Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings from bygone books. Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings by Gary and Ruth from the classic books of Celtic lore and study. Book 2, Chapter 2 of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes. Chapter 2 Household Ghosts and Hidden Treasures, including The Miser of St. Donuts and Dewey's Ghost, The Ghost on Horseback, Hidden Objects of Small Value. From Breckenshire to Philadelphia in 36 hours. Sir David Lloyd, the magician. The levitation of Walter Jones. Superstitions regarding hares. The legend of Monticello's lambs. Aerial transportation in modern spiritualism. Exercising household ghosts. And the story of haunted Margaret. Section 1. The majority of stories of this class turn on the subject of hidden treasures. The popular belief is that if a person die while any hoarded money, or indeed metal of any kind, were it nothing more than old iron, is still hidden secretly, the spirit of that person cannot rest. Its perturbation can only be relieved by finding a human hand to take the hidden metal and throw it down the stream of a river. To throw it up the stream will not do. The Ogamore is the favourite river for this purpose in Lower Glamorganshire. The spirit selects a particular person as the subject of its attentions and haunts that person till asked what it wants, when it prefers its request. Some say it is only ill-gotten treasure which creates this disturbance of the grave's repose. A tailor's wife at Llantwit Major who had been a stout and jolly dame, was thus haunted until she was worn to the semblance of a skeleton, for not choosing to take a hoard honestly to the Ogmore. But flesh and blood could not resist forever, and so this is her story. I at last consented, for the sake of quiet, to take the treasure to the river, and the spirit wafted me through the air so high that I saw below me the church loft and all the houses as if I leant out of a balloon. When I took the treasure to throw it into the river, in my flurry I flung it upstream instead of down, and on this the spirit, with a savage look, tossed me into a whirlwind, and however I got back to my home I know not. The bell-ringers found her lying insensible in the church lane as they were going home from church late in the evening. Section 2 There was an old curmudgeon of a money hoarder, who lived in a cottage on the far side of the Coombe, or Dingle, at St. Donuts, not far from the castle. His housekeeper was an antique dame of quaint aspect. He died, and the dame lived there alone. But she began to grow so gaunt and grisly, that people wondered at it, and the children ran frightened from her. Someone finally got from her the confession that she was haunted by the miser's ghost. To relieve her of its presence, the Methodists resolved to hold a prayer meeting in the haunted house. While they were there, singing and praying, the old woman suddenly jumped up and screamed, There he is! There he is! The people grew silent, and then someone said, Ask it what it wants. "Uh, What do you want? quavered the old woman. No one heard the reply, except the dame, who presently said, "Uh, Where is it? And then the old woman nodding and staring as if obeying an invisible mandate, groped her way to the chimney, thrust her gaunt arm up, and drew down a bag of money. And with this she cried out, Let me go! Let me go! Which no one preventing her, she did as quickly as a flash of light. Some young men by the door followed her, and it being a bright moonlit night, beheld her whisk over the stile without touching it, and so off up the road towards the Ogmore. The people now resumed their praying and singing. It was an hour before the old woman got back, and then she was found to be spattered with mud and bedraggled with wet, as if she'd been having a terrific time. 
She had indeed, as she confessed, been to the Ogmore, and thrown the bag of money down the stream. The ghost had then taken off its hat, made a low bow, and vanished, to trouble her no more. Section 3 A young man from Llawell Parish, who was courting a lass who lodged at the house of Thomas Richard, in the Vale of Towie, found himself haunted as he went to and fro by the ghost of Anne Dewey, a woman who had hanged herself. She would not only meet him in the road and frighten him, but she would come to his bedside and so scare him that he fell ill. While he was ill, his cousin came to see him, and thinking his illness was due to his being crossed in love, rallied him, saying, Oofed! Be are sick because thy carry adders refuse thee. But being gravely answered, and told of Anne Dewey's ghost, this cousin advised the haunted man to speak to her. Speak to her, said he, or thou wilt have no quiet. I will go with thee and see thou shalt have no harm. So they went out, and they called at Tavana Garreg, an inn not far off. But the haunted man could not drink, and often looked towards the door. What ails the man? asked the taproom loungers. He continued to be uneasy, and finally went out, his cousin following him, and then he saw the ghost again. "'Oh, God, here she is!' he cried out, his teeth chattering and his eyes rolling. "'It is a sad thing,' said his cousin. "'I know not what to think of thee. But, uh, but come, I will go with thee. Go where thou wilt.' And they returned to the alehouse, and after a while the haunted man started up, saying he was called. But when others offered to go with him, he said, No, he must go alone. He did go alone, and spoke to the ghost, who said, Fear nothing, follow me. She led him to a spot behind the house where she had lived when in the flesh, and where she had hanged herself, and bade him take from the wall a small bag. He did so. The bag contained a great sum of money in pieces of gold. He guessed it might be two hundred pounds or more. But the ghost, greatly to his regret, bade him go and cast it into the river. He obeyed, against his better judgment. The next day, and for many a day thereafter, people looked for that money where he had thrown it in the river. But it never could be found. The Reverend Thomas Lewis, a dissenting minister in those parts, saw the place in the wall where the money had been hid in the haunted house, and he wondered how the young man could reach it, it being so very high, but thought it likely he was assisted by the ghost. Section 4 This same Reverend Thomas Lewis was well acquainted with a man who was similarly employed by a perturbed spirit, and was at the man's bedside when he died. This ghost was in the appearance of a clergyman, dressed in black clothes, with a white wig on, as the man was looking out of an alehouse window one night, he saw this ghost on horseback and went out to him. The ghost bowed and silently offered him drink, but this was declined. And thereupon the ghost lifted his hat, crooked his elbow, and said in a hollow tone, At a sir, towards you, sir. But others who were there could see nothing and hear nothing. The ghost then said, Go to Clifford Castle in Radnorshire, take out some money which lies hidden there, and throw it into the river. Do this, I charge thee, or thou shalt have no rest. Further and more explicit directions were then given, and the unhappy man set out against his will for Clifford Castle, which is the castle in which was born fair Rosamond, King Henry the Second's beautiful favourite. No one but himself was allowed to enter the castle, although he was permitted to have a friend's company to the ruined gate thereof. It was dark when they came to the castle, but he was guided to the place where the money was, and ran with it, and flung it into the river. After that, he was haunted no more. An old house at Tanatur in Carnarvonshire was haunted by a ghost whose troubles were a reversal of the rule. A new tenant, who took possession of the house a few years ago, was so bothered by this spectre that he resolved to question it. He did so, and got for answer the information that if he would deposit a particular sum of money in a specified place, his ghost ship would cease to walk. The man actually did this, 
and it acted like magic. The money disappeared with promptitude, and the ghost came there no more. A man at Crimlin, Monmouthshire, was haunted by a ghost whose trouble related to a hidden object of small value. Nevertheless, the spectre was so importunate that the man set out one night to accompany it to the scene of perturbation. In due time they came to a huge stone, which the ghost bade its friend lift up, who replied that he had not sufficient strength, it being a pretty large rock that he was thus requested to move. "'But try,' said the ghost. So he tried, and lo, it was lifted as if it had been a feather. He drew forth a pike, or mattock, and the light, the man afterward related, was as, as great as if the sun shone, and in the snow there was no impression of the feet of either of us. They went to the river, and by the ghost's command the man threw the pike over his head into the water, standing with his back to the flood. The ghost then conducted him home, and never troubled him more. But for a long time after, he was out of his senses. This was an illustration, according to the popular belief, of the wickedness of hiding anything, however trifling its value, a practice strongly condemned by the Welsh peasantry. There is a Glamorganshire story about a certain young man who, returning late at night from courting his sweetheart, felt tired and, sitting down, fell asleep. He had not slept long when he was aroused by a strange noise, and looking up recognised the ghost of his departed grandfather. Inquiring the cause of the old gentleman's visit to the scene of trials, he got this answer. Under the corner of the thatch of your roof, look, and you will find a pair of silver spurs, surreptitiously obtained by me when in the flesh, and hidden there. Mm. Throw them into the river Tuff, and I shall be at peace. The young man obeyed these instructions, and found the spurs accordingly, and although many persons were present when he climbed to the roof and fumbled under the thatch, and saw him in the very act, not one among them could see the spurs, which were to them invisible. They said, however, that when the purloined spurs had been thrown into the river, a bright flame was seen to flash along the water. Section 5 a large proportion of these stories of ghostly perturbation concerning hidden treasure include a further feature of great interest, relating to transportation through the air. I have mentioned that ghosts sometimes employ the services of the fairy Bubach in thus carrying mortals from place to place. The fairies of Wales are indeed frequently found to be on the best of terms with the ghosts. Their races have much in common, and so many of their practices are alike that one is not always absolutely sure whether he's dealing with a fairy or a spectre until some test point crops up. However, in transporting a mortal through the air, ghost and fairy work together. The Bubach, being set his task, complacently gives the mortal the choice of being transported above wind, amid wind, or below wind. The value of knowing beforehand what to expect was never better illustrated than in this place. The mortal, who with a natural reluctance to get into an unpleasantly swift current, avoids travelling midwind, misses a pleasant journey, for midwind is the only agreeable mode of being borne by a boobach. Should you choose to go above wind, you are transported so high that you skim the clouds and are in danger of being frightened to death. But choosing the below wind course is even worse, for then, you are dragged through bush, through briar, in a way to impress upon you the advice of Apollo to Phaeton, and to teach you the value of the golden mean, in Medio Tutissimus Ibis. Section 6 In the parish of Ustradgundleis, in Breconshire, Thomas Schleswin, an innkeeper's son, was often troubled by the spirit of a well-dressed woman, who used to stand before him in narrow lanes, as if to bar his passage, but he always got by her, though in great alarm. One night he mustered up courage to speak to her, and ask her what she wanted with him, to which she replied, Be not afraid, I will not hurt thee. And then she told him he must go to Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, and take a box from a house there, which she described, in which there was a sum of two hundred pounds. But as he did not know how to get to that far-off place, 
He said as much. Meet me here next Friday night, said the phantom. Meet me. I charge thee. She then vanished. The young man went home and told this story to his neighbours and friends. They held a consultation with the curate of the parish, who promptly appointed a prayer meeting for that Friday night, to which the young man was bidden, and by which it was hoped the purpose of the ghost to spirit him off to Philadelphia might be circumvented. The meeting continued until midnight, and when it broke up, the young man's friends stayed with him. But they had no sooner got beyond the parson's stables than he was taken from among them. His subsequent adventures are thus related by himself. And the, the apparition carried me away to a river and, and threw me into it, chiding me for telling the people of our appointed meeting, and for not coming to meet her as she had charged me, uh, but bade me be not afraid that she would not hurt me because she had not charged me to be silent on the subject. Nevertheless, I had done wrong to go to the parson's house. Now, said she, we begin the journey. I was then lifted up and carried away, I know not how, and when I came to the place, in Philadelphia, I was taken into a house and conducted to a fine room. The spirit then bade me lift up a board, which I did. I then saw the box and took it. Then the spirit said, I must go three miles and cast it into the black sea. We went, as I thought, to a lake of clear water, where I was commanded to throw the box into it, which, when I did, there was such a noise as if all about was going to pieces, and from thence I was taken up and carried to the place where I was first taken up. I, I then asked her, Am I free now? And she said I was, and then she told me a secret which she strictly charged me to tell no person. Extensive and ingenious guessing was indulged in by all Astrid Gunleis as to what this secret might be, and one woman made herself popular by remembering that there was a certain Elizabeth Gething in other days who had gone from this neighbourhood to Pennsylvania, and the conclusion was eagerly arrived at that this was the woman whose phantom the young man saw, and that the secret she told him was her name when alive. They questioned him as to her appearance, and he said that she was largely made, very pale, her looks severe, and her voice hollow, different from a human voice. This was considered by the Astrodgan Lycians, with many nods to each other, as a most accurate description of what Elizabeth Gething would probably be, after having shuffled off this mortal coil. The time occupied in this mysterious transportation and ghostly enterprise was three days and three nights, that is, from Friday night to Monday night, and when the voyager came home, he could scarcely speak. Section 7 Sir David Lloyd, the Welsh magician, was once at Lanid Lois town in Montgomeryshire, and as he was going home late at night, saw a boy there from his neighbourhood. He asked the lad if he would like to ride home behind him, and receiving an affirmative reply, took the boy up behind him on the horse's back, and they rode so swiftly that they were home in no time, and the boy lost one of his garters in the journey. The next day, seeing something hanging in the ash tree near the church, he climbed up to learn what it was, and to his great surprise found it was the garter he had lost. Mm -hmm. Which shows they rode home in the air, observes the Prophet Jones in telling the story. Mr. Jones has a number of extraordinary narrators of this class, e.g. the following, which I condense. Henry Edmund of Haverdavel was one night visiting Charles Hugh, the conjurer of Aberystwyth, and they walked together as far as Lanhithel, where Hugh tried to persuade his companion to stay all night with him at a public house. Edmund refused and said he would go home. You had better stay said Hugh in a meaning tone. But Edmund went out into the street, when he was seized by invisible hands and borne through the air to Landovery in Carmarthenshire, a distance of fully fifty miles as the crow flies. There he was set down at a public place, where he had before been, and talked with people who knew him. He then went out into the street, when he was seized again, and borne back to Lanhithel, arriving there the next morning at daybreak. And the first man he met was the conjurer, Charles Hugh, who said, Did I not tell you you'd better stay with me?
Section 8. The landlord of the inn at Langattuck, Crickhowell in Breconshire, was a man called Richard the Tailor. He was more than suspected of resorting to the company of fairies and of practising infernal arts. One day, a company of gentlemen were hunting in the vicinity when the hounds started a hare, which ran so long and so hard that everybody was prostrated with fatigue and this hare disappeared from view at the cellar window of the inn kept by Richard the tailor. The circumstance begat a suspicion among the hunters that the hare which had so bothered them was none other than Richard the tailor himself, and that his purpose in taking that form had been to lead them a dance and bring them to the door of his inn at an hour too late for them to return home, and thus compelling them to spend their money there. They stayed, however, being very tired. But they growled very hard at their landlord, and were perfectly free with their comments on his base conduct. One of their party, having occasion to go outdoors during the evening, did not come back. His name was Walter Jones, and he was well known in that part of the country. The company became uneasy at his absence, and began to abuse the landlord roundly, threatening to burn the house if Walter Jones did not return. Notwithstanding their threats, Walter Jones came not back all night. Late the next morning, he made his appearance, looking like one who had been drawn through thorns and briars, with his hair in disorder and his whole aspect terribly demoralised. His story was soon told. He had no sooner got out of doors than invisible hands had whisked him up and whirled him along rough ways until daybreak when he found himself near the town of Newport, helping a man from Brisker to raise a load of coal upon his horse. Suddenly he became insensible, and was whisked back again to the inn, where they now saw him. The distance he traversed in going to and fro was about forty miles, and Walter Jones, who had hitherto been an ungodly man, mended his ways from that time forth. Section 9 there are many points in all these traditional stories which are suggestive of interesting comparisons and constantly remind us of the significance of details which at first sight seem trivial. The supposed adoption of the hair form by the tailor recalls a host of mythological details. The hair has been identified with the sun god Michabo of the American Indians who sleeps through the winter months and symbolises the sleep of nature precisely as in the fairy myth of the Sleeping Maiden and the Welsh legends of Sleeping Heroes. Among the Hottentots, the hare figures as the servant of the moon. In China, the hare is viewed as a telluric genius in one province and everywhere as a divine animal. In Wales, one of the most charming of the local legends relates how a hare flying from the hounds took refuge under a fair saint's robes so that the hares were ever after called monocellar's lambs in that parish. Up to a comparatively recent time, no person in the parish would kill a hare. When a hare was pursued by dogs, it was firmly believed that if anyone cried, God and Saint Monocella be with thee, it was sure to escape. The legend is related by Pennant in his tour through Montgomeryshire. At, at about two miles distant from Llanginog, I turned up a small valley to the right to pay my devotions to the shrine of St. Monacella, or as the Welsh style her, Melangell. She was the daughter of an Irish monarch who had determined to marry her to a nobleman of the court. The princess had vowed celibacy. She fled from her father's dominions and took refuge in this place, where she lived fifteen years without seeing the face of man. Brachwell as Cuthrog, Prince of Powys, being one day a hare hunting, pursued his game till he came to a great thicket, when he was amazed to find a virgin of surprising beauty engaged in deep devotion with the hare he had been pursuing under her robe, boldly facing the dogs, who retired to a distance, howling, notwithstanding all the efforts of the sportsmen to make them seize their prey. When the huntsman blew his horn, it stuck to his lips. Brachwell heard her story and gave to God and her a parcel of lands to be a sanctuary to all who fled there. He desired her to found an abbey on the spot. She did so and died abbess of it in a good old age. 
She was buried in the neighbouring church. Her hard bed is shown in the cleft of a neighbouring rock. Her tomb was in the little chapel or oratory, adjoining to the church and now used as a vestry room. The room is still called Kech Yabez, cell of the grave. The legend is perpetuated by some rude wooden carvings of the saint, with numbers of hairs scuttling to her for protection. Section 10 It is interesting to observe, in connection with the subject of transportation through the air, with what vitality this superstition lingers in modern spiritualism. The accounts of such transportation are familiar to every reader of newspapers. That Mr. Home was seen by a learned English nobleman sailing through the moonlight seventy feet from the ground is on record. That Mrs. Guppy was transported from Highbury Park to Lamb's Conduit Street in London in a trance and a state of partial disabille is also on record and that a well-known American spiritualist was born by invisible hands from Chicago to Milwaukee and back between midnight and 4am, I have been assured by a number of persons in Illinois, who thoroughly believed it, or said they did. But it certainly is not too much to demand that people who give credence to these instances of aerial transportation should equally believe in the good old ghost stories of the Welsh. The same consistency calls for credulity as to the demoniacal elevation of Simon Magus and the broomstick riding of the witches whose supernatural levitation was credited by Lord Bacon and Sir Matthew Hale, not to speak of Addison and Wesley. There is something peculiarly fascinating to the gross denizens of earth in this notion of skimming like a bird over housetops. No dreams, save those of love and dalliance, are so charming to the dreamer as visions of flying. To find oneself floating along over the tops of trees, over the streets where less favoured mortals walk, to look down on them as they stroll, is to feel an exquisite pleasure. The mind of childhood and that of ignorance, alike unable to discriminate between reality and illusion, would naturally retain the impression of such a dream with peculiar vividness. The superstition has no doubt been fostered by this fact, although it, like most superstitions, began its career in prehistoric days. The same class of belief attaches to the magical lore of widely separated lands in all ages. The magic carpet of the Arabian Nights finds its parallel today in the enchanted mat of the Chinese conjurer, which carries him from place to place, at a height of twenty or thirty feet in the air. The levitation involved is in the Welsh story embedded in the person of Skilty a Scoundroid. When he was sent on a message through the wood, he went along the tops of the trees. In his whole life, a blade of reed grass never bent beneath his feet, so light was his tread. Section 11 It remains but to add, in connection with our household ghosts, that the method of exercising such goblins in Wales is explicit. The objectionable spectre must be conjured in the name of heaven to depart and return no more. Not always is this exorcism effective. The ghost may have a specific purpose in hand, or it may be obstinate. The strength of the exorcism is doubled by employing the Latin language to deliver it. It receives its utmost power, however, through the clergy. Three clergymen, it is thought, will exorcise any ghost that walks. The exorcism is usually for a stated period. Seven years is the favourite time, one hundred years the limit. There are many instances where a ghost which has been laid a hundred years returned at the end of the time to its old haunts. In all cases it is necessary that the ghost should agree to be exercised. No power can lay it if it be possessed of an evil demon, a spirit within a spirit, as it were, which stubbornly refuses to listen to argument. In such cases the terrors of heaven must be rigorously invoked, but the result is only temporary. Properly constituted family ghosts, however, will lend a reasonable ear to entreaty, backed by prayer. There are even cases on record where the ghost has been the entreater, as in the story of Haunted Margaret. Haunted Margaret, or Margaret Rasprid, was a servant girl who lived in the parish of Pandeg. She had been seduced by a man who promised to marry her, and a day was set for their wedding. But when the day came, 
the man was not on hand, and Margaret thereupon fell on her knees in the church and prayed heaven that her seducer might have no rest, either in this world or in the world to come. In due course, the man died, and immediately his ghost came to haunt Margaret Richard. People heard her in the night saying to the ghost, No, oh, what dost thou want? Or, Be quiet, let me alone. And hence it was that she came to be known in that parish by the nickname of Margaret Rusprid. One evening, when the haunted woman was at the house of Mrs. Hercules Jenkins at Trostra, she began to be uneasy, as it grew late, and she said, I must go home now, or else I shall be sure to meet him on the way home. Mrs. Jenkins advised Margaret to speak to him. And tell him thou dost forgive him, said the good dame. Margaret went her way, and as she drew near a stile at the end of a footbridge, she saw the ghost at the stile, waiting for her. When she came up to it, the ghost said, do thou forgive me, and God will forgive thee. Forgive me, and I shall be at rest, and never trouble thee any more. Margaret then forgave him, and he shook hands with her in a friendly way, and vanished. <laughs> that was book two, chapter two of British Goblins. Welsh folklore, fairy mythology, legends and traditions. A link to the full text can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. You can also find all of the names, place names and other non-English words written down for you in the show notes in the order in which they appear in this reading. If you'd like to comment on this chapter, pop over to our show notes and join in or start a conversation. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not try our sister podcast, The Celtic Myth Pod Show, which brings the stories of ancient Celts to life with narrative and drama, as well as bringing you modern Celtic music, stories and information. Find The Celtic Myth Pod Show in all the places where the best podcasts hang out, or on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. You've been listening to Celtic Tomes, read by Gary and Ruth. Our theme music is Gander in the Pretty Hole by Slauncher, and a link to their music can be found in the show notes at CelticTomes.Libsyn.com. This podcast has been produced by The Celtic Myth Show. (laughs) 